Good evening, everybody. Come on, good evening, everybody. I said somebody. I said good evening, everybody. Praise the Lord. Are you glad once again to be in the house of the Lord? Another night of revival. Would you just touch your neighbor and say, I'm just so happy to be here. Come on, that was the wrong neighbor. If you find another neighbor, just lean on your neighbor. Say, I'm glad to be here. Come on, would you just stand to your feet as we begin worship tonight? Listen, the Holy Ghost has been here all day, so I know it's a word <laughs> and, a, and, and, and something that God has uh, in store just for you. Amen? Amen? Come on, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for another day. And we wanted your presence so much today. Rain was not going to stop us from getting here. Uh, come what may, we need to be closer to you. We need you uh, more in our lives, in our families, in our relationships. So, Father, we ask that you would give us something tonight that we stand in need of. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated if you want to. We're going to go ahead and start worship. How many want to lift his name high tonight? I said you can be seated if you want to. You might just want to stand. Come on, put your hands together. Lord, I lift your name on high. Anybody want to lift them tonight? Lord, I lift. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. Lord, I love to sing Come on, your I'm so praises. Glad, I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. I'm so glad Come on, let's sing that again. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came us. from heaven to earth. You came from heaven to earth. Show the way. To show from the, the earth. earth. From the earth to my dead to pay my dead from the to cross pay. from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky grave to Lord the I lift sky. your name on high Lord I lift your name on come on put your hands together anybody thankful let's go up one come on Lord I lift your name Lord I lift Lord I lift your name on high Lord I love to sing your praises Lord I love to sing your praises I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us I'm so I don't think I got it come on let's sing that one more time Lord I lift your name on high Lord I lift your name on high Lord I love to sing your praises Lord I love to sing your praises I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. I'm so glad you came to save us. Come on, you came from heaven to earth. Came from heaven to earth. You came from heaven to earth. Show the way. Show from the, the earth. Way. From the earth to the my cross. Debt to pay. My debt from to pay. From the cross. From the cross to the grave. Hey. From the grave to Lord, the I lift your name. Lord, I lift your name on high. Oh, you came. From heaven to earth, show the way. Show from the, the way, way, from the earth to my the cross. debt to pay. My debt oh, to pay. From, from the cross to the, the grave. grave, from the grave to Lord, the sky. Lord, I live. Lord, I live. Let's go one more. On hey, you came. You came from heaven to earth. Show the to way. Show from the, the earth, way, from the earth to my the cross. My debt to pay. My debt from the cross. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I live. Lord, I live. Let's go one more. On hey, you came. You came from heaven to earth. Show the to way. Show from the way. From the earth to the cross. My dead to pay. My dead to pay. From the cross to the grave. From the grave to the sky. Lord, I live. Lord, I live. Not just repeat after me. They say, I lift your name. 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 Higher. Higher. 
I live to name. 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 Let's go up. Say, I live to name. I live to name. I live to name. Hallelujah. I live to name. I live to name. You don't got it yet. I live to name. 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 Oh, I live to name. I live to name. I live to name. Oh, I live to name. I live to name. Higher, higher. His name is great, great, and wonderful, and wonderful, and mighty, and mighty. I live to name. I live to name. His name is great, great, and wonderful, and wonderful, and mighty, and mighty. I live to name. I live to name. I live to name. I live to name. He pays my bills. He pays my bills. And food to eat. And food to eat. And a car to drive. And car to drive. I live to name. I live to name. A roof over my head. A roof over my head. And clothes to wear. And clothes to wear. And food to eat. And food to eat. I live to name. 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 You came, you came, you came, you came. You came from heaven to earth. Show the way. To show the way. way. From the earth to my the cross. My debt to pay. My debt from the to cross. Pay. From the cross to grave the grave. To the sky. From the grave to I the sky. Live. Lord, I lift your name on high. 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 I am persuaded, Lord, to love you. I have been changed to bless your name. I am constrained by this great God spoke forever to worship thee. Help me say, help me say, I am, I am persuaded. Lord, I
gospel. By His great God, for and forever to worship Thee. Oh, we love to worship You. Yes, we do. Forever to worship You. Forever. Come on, put your hands together for Jesus. Listen, we want to go into prayer right now. How many of y'all have kids? How many of you know some kids you need to pray for? Can you find somebody? Come on and find somebody you didn't come with. And we want to pray tonight, especially for our children. Even if you don't have any biological kids, you've seen some kids running around this church, You've seen some kids at school, you know you need to pray for them. And we want to intercede on behalf of family, uh, children tonight. Come on, find somebody. Come on, lift this thing with me. Oh, take me back. Take me back. Take me back. Take me back, dear Lord. the place. To the place where I, where I first oh, received you. Would you take me back? Take me back. Take me back, dear Lord. Take me back, oh, dear Lord, where I first believed. Come on, lift it one more time. Would you take me back? Take me back, take me back, dear Lord. Take me back, dear Lord. To the place, to the place where I, where I first received you. Would you take me back? Take me back, take me back, dear Lord. Take me back, dear Lord, where I. Would you find somebody? Pray for some children tonight. assembled with one another, praying for children. Lord, and it just calls my mind to the time when you were on the Mount of Transfiguration, in the presence of your Father, in the presence of Moses and Elijah, and the disciples were taken aback, not knowing 
what it was that they were experiencing and not knowing that at the base of the mountain was a child who needed to be delivered. All too often, Father, we find ourselves engaged and enamored with things of this world and missing the opportunity to see our children delivered. Not knowing our hands are right on the mountain where we have access to all power. And as Jesus descended the mountain, he didn't whisper some incantation. Father, he didn't say something snazzy and snappy. He just merely rebuked the demon and the child was delivered. And so on today, Father, as we lay hold on Jesus, knowing that all power is in him and that he is connected to you, we claim in the name of Jesus Christ that anything that is tearing our children, that is uh, consuming our children, that is hindering our children from coming closer to you, we rebuke it in the name of Jesus Christ. Not because there's any power in us, not because of anything that we have done right, but because Jesus lives, breathes, and in him we have our being. So even now, Father, we just want to bring our children to your son, knowing that he has the power to deliver them from any malady, whether it be physical, spiritual, or otherwise. So even now, Father, we believe but please help our unbelief that as we give our children into your hands, we know that they can be restored. We know that they can be saved. We know that they can be delivered. We know that they can be healed. We know that they can come closer to Jesus Christ. We know that they can come into a saving relationship with you. And so right now, we just want to praise you for what you have done, what you are doing, And what you will do in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we claim victory. In Jesus' name, we claim salvation for our children. For it is the matchless name of Jesus Christ that we pray. And the church of the living God said amen for God. Said amen for the Son, Jesus Christ. And said amen for the Holy Ghost. Listen, have you been enjoying revival? Come on, don't play with it. Have you been enjoying revival? I told y'all a couple weeks ago, you better not miss a night. And some of y'all thought I was lying. But you'll call me a prophet now, won't you? (laughs) You're laughing, I'm serious. It's just been good to be in the presence of God this week. Not by ourselves, but with family. And the Lord has blessed us this week uh, with Pastor Myron Edmonds. Um, Man, were y'all here last night? Come on, were you really here? Yes, hallelujah. Because sometimes we we sitting in church, but our mind is other places. Was your was your body, mind, and spirit here to receive that word? And uh, tonight, the Lord has just been on him to deal with marriages tonight. And um, I think we were talking about this earlier. You know, somebody said, "Well, I'm not single, so this message is not for me." And I'm just at a place now in my life where. It doesn't matter what the focus of the word is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you open, you can get something. That's right. That's right. So your prayer tonight ought to be, Lord, whatever you teach me, tell me tonight, help me to be open to what you're saying. Before he comes, we just want to, anybody want to be drawn close to Jesus? In fact, if you really need him, you ought to be up on your feet right now just in worship, asking God to draw him, draw you close to him and never let you go. Come on, draw me close. Draw me close to you. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. Come on, sing. Never let me go. I lay it all down again. This is what you're asking, God. I lay it all down again. Just to hear you say that I'm your friend. To hear you say that I'm your friend. Come on, you are my desire. That's our prayer tonight, God. You are my, you are my desire. No one else can do. Anybody feel that tonight? Yeah. No one else can do. No one else can take your place. 
No one else can take your place. To feel the warmth of your embrace. To feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find my way. Anybody need to find their way tonight? Help me find my way. Bring me back to you. Bring me back to you. That's our prayer tonight. Come on, shout this. You're all I want. How many want to be closer to the Lord? Not just because I asked you, but how many for real want to be closer to the Lord? Praise the Lord today. Let's just thank the Lord one more time for that worship experience. Praise the Lord. I love to worship the Lord. Amen. Just takes your mind off all the stuff you got. And if you're a constant worshiper, you can stay in that place, amen? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so the Lord is teaching me how to, how to bless him at all times. And let his praise be continually in my mouth, amen? 
It did not say in your heart. Come on, somebody. <laughs> it ought to be there, amen? But it ought to work its way to your mouth. Somebody ought to say praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you got to talk to yourself, amen? <laughs> the Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. <laughs> yes, sir, because sometimes you can't find nobody to encourage you. You better learn how to find a place of worship sometimes. How many, how many of you have turned your cubicles into a sanctuary before? <laughs> Or went up into a bathroom stall and got a praise on. <laughs> You're driving in your car and uh, you just got to do a pullover praise. Come on. <laughs> yes. Worship. I'm learning that. Uh, that worship is a lifestyle. Would you say amen? And we just thank God just that the pastor, the leadership team of this church was led to give us four days where we could come aside and be revived. Amen. And so revival is good, but how many know we need some reformation in our lives as well, which is to say we need to make some changes. And by the grace of God, I'm coming to discover that I, on my own, I ain't going to make no changes. <laughs> the Holy Ghost got to force me to do some stuff. Come on. <laughs> oh, boy. If you could go to heaven just the way you were, you would. <laughs> Most of us don't think there's anything wrong with us anyway. <laughs> Thank God for marriage. That's why we're going to talk about that tonight. <laughs> Amen. And so we just simply want to offer a word of prayer. Is that all right? We get into the word. Father, we're just praying tonight that on this subject, as pastor said, so often the focus might be narrow of the teaching, but we know that God is big enough to cover everybody. And that there is a word for us. Your word says, if we hunger and thirst for righteousness, then we can expect to be filled. So tonight we're hungry, Father. Some of us have fought through traffic and been through stuff just to get here tonight. And so we come with our hands open and our hearts open. Our minds are even open. And so we give you permission now to say whatever you want to say, do whatever you want. Call us to account in whatever area of your lives, every nook and cranny, every crevices of our lives. We no longer close the door, but we open up the door and we let the Spirit of God move in even now. And we give you the praise. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen and amen. I want to say that um, this is one subject here where you have to excuse the pastor for uh, his reluctance and reticence and hesitation because <clears throat> your boy is not living this thing here. <laughs> uh, thanks for the amens. <laughs> I, just, I just felt judged for a minute. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 now by the way, this is, you do know that preachers have to preach stuff that they're not living. Oh yeah, we got to preach the whole Bible. <laughs> What I'm saying is I'm not at the standard that the Bible requires. I'm not there. The Bible says, be ye therefore perfect. Is that, is that not what the word says? <laughs> if God would have said anything less than perfect, then guess who could have got the credit for our salvation? He had to raise that thing up real high. Come on in. Now, you ain't there, amen? <laughs> You're not there. So at least admit with me now that you ain't living it completely, amen? <laughs> if you are, you'd have been translated by now. But if you're up in here tonight, that means you, need, you still need God, amen? Especially on this subject of marriage. Oh, my God. So I want to teach on the subject tonight, the marriage myth, the marriage myth, the marriage myth, or the marriage lie. And I'd like to begin by reading from the book of Genesis, the second chapter. Genesis chapter 2, and I'd like to begin at verse number 15, amen? Genesis chapter 2 and verse number, well, let's begin at verse number 8. Is that all right? Genesis chapter 2, and let's begin at verse number 8. The Bible says, now the Lord God had planted a garden, had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food in the middle of the garden where the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Verse 10, a, a river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into 
four headwaters. The name of the first is Pishon. It's winds through the entire, it winds through the entire land of Havilah where there is gold. Now, this was, some, this was a serious place here, y'all. It was just gold everywhere. <coughs> Verse 12, the Bible says the gold of that land is good and it was aromatic, which is to say the, the gold smelled good. <coughs> God left no details out when he was decorating the crib. And onyx are also there. By the way, Eden represents the presence of God. What does Eden represent, everybody? Verse 13 says, the name of the second river is, 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 is Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Basically what the Bible is saying is, is the environment in which God created Adam was beyond perfect. It met every need. And he added some gravy on top of it. Got gold smelling good. Huh? putting trees in there and decorating it. In other words, God is laying this thing out to set them up to have the perfect relationship with him. Amen? Verse 14 says, the name of the third river is Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher and the fourth river is Euphrates. Verse 15, the Lord God, and here's where we're really going to try to look. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it. Amen. <laughs> and take care of it. So Adam was given responsibility, he was given purpose, he was given a job. Come on, say amen. Now, uh, people love to say amen on job because they think of simply of employment. What Adam had was purpose, and purpose is bigger than employment. You can be unemployed and have purpose, amen? Amen. And, uh, and most of the, a lot of times, our, our profession and our purpose are not linked together for, for some of us. <laughs> And it goes on to say, what verse am I at, everybody? 16, and the Lord God commanded the man. Now, I want you to watch this here. Watch what happens here. The Bible says the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden in his presence, right, to work it and take care of it. Verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for when you eat of it, you will surely die. All right, now pause for a minute. Notice what just happened here. God, for six days, has created a perfect environment for man to enjoy relationship with him. Somebody say relationship. Remember now, the whole purpose of creation is so that man might enjoy relationship with God. God did not create man in order to satisfy some need in him. God created man so that, in fact, we could know who he was. He did not have to do it, the old folks say, but he did. You're here today. The very existence of humanity is an act of grace. He did not have to create us. He knew what was going to happen, but even though he knew what was going to happen, he created us in advance. The Bible says, and even before the foundations of the earth, he was the lamb slain. So this blows my mind here, how God knew the risk factors of creating people like him, knowing that we were going to turn our backs on him, knowing that everything that he created would be taken for granted, every blessing given would be snarled, every, every opportunity given would be, would be dissed. He knew that on the front end. But yet and still, he made the perfect environment. Now I'm saying something here as it relates to marriage as we get further in this thing. You have to understand context. God created man. First, he gave them everything he, need, he needed, then he brought man. Six days of setting him up, then he brought him in. That's the way grace works. God gives us blessings, then God gives us himself. Watch this now. God does not ask us to give him what he has not already done in our lives. He never asks us to reciprocate what he hadn't already done. In other words, when man came on the scene, man had already been giving what he didn't deserve. Grace showed up before sin showed up. He steps on the scene. He didn't work for nothing. He didn't plant nothing. He only had to work what God had already given him. Oh, come on in here. So watch this now. So watch this now. So as, as he's working what God already gave him, then God says, now, by the way, I've got to give you a choice in this relationship. And the word of God says that he put a tree in the middle of the garden, which was the tree of the knowledge of good and what, everybody? Of good and evil, which represents choice, right? 
And so watch this now. The choice that he gave him was a choice to bail out on the relationship. Is that not right? In other words, Adam had a choice to bail out on the relationship with God if he so choose. In other words, God is simply saying to us, watch this, guys, that love is not love if it bears any resemblance of control. That's why a controlling husband is not a godly husband. A controlling wife is not a godly wife. It's not even in the mind of God. God doesn't even behave that way, right? So, so notice now, now, now I want you to get context. All the blessings of God have been provided. Adam shows up. He hadn't deserved anything. God breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. He makes Adam just like himself. Adam is the closest thing to God that has ever existed. And so now Adam is in this world that God has created just for him. And the Bible says he puts choice in the middle. And choice represents risk. There is a risk factor in our relationships with each other and in our relationships with God. There's a risk factor there. There is a danger zone in the relationship. In the middle of the garden, there is danger. Now watch this. The Bible says... He says in 17, he says, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Verse 18 says, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. This mic is going in and out. Should I? I'm good? All right, so watch this. If I asked you, what is the context of marriage? I would be curious to know what your response is. In other words, our expectations dictate how we enter into the marriage relationship. This is one of the reasons why we're having so much of a problem in our marriages because people are entering into marriage with under false pretense. In other words, we don't know why we're getting married. Most folks are getting married to be happy. Back in the day, the premise of marriage was simply just to take care of somebody. In, 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 in early biblical days, it was more, it was more husbandry. It was more, it was more security. But as times has progressed, marriage is now based on happiness. And I want to just show you now, there's nothing you just read that suggests that when God created marriage, that he created it for the purpose, self-expressed purpose of happiness. So watch this now. If you're not happy in your marriage then that's not a reason, right? To say that you don't have a successful marriage. Or that it's time to renege on the commitment of marriage. I don't know how many people come to me all the time and they always say, well, I'm not happy anymore, so I'm walking. Well, guess what? That's not why you get married in the first place. Listen, if you get married, all the married folk talk to me. If you get married to be happy, do please do something else. False pretense, right? And so, and so what I'm about to show you right now is why God, and we got to get this before we get anything else, why God created marriage. First, check it out. Adam is there. He's got everything he needs, but there's a risk. There is a temptation. There is the risk to leave God. There's a, there's a risk to walk out of relationship with God in the middle of the garden, and it's represented by the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? So watch this. As soon as God tells Adam, look, Adam, be careful. There is a tree. I'm telling you not to touch it. I'm telling, I'm warning you, be careful. There is danger. There is something here to separate you from me. The next thing he says is, it's not good for man to be alone. Are y'all still with me? Are you still with me? All right, so watch this now. The Hebrew, oh, we'll switch word. All right, here we go. The Hebrew word here, I want you to go back to the text. Go to Genesis chapter 2, and I want you to look at verse 18, 17 again. Verse 17 says, he gives them a warning. Somebody shout a warning. He says, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Verse 18 then says, the Lord God said, it's not good. Why isn't it good? It's not good for him to be alone because there is temptation in the garden to separate him from me. So I need to give him some help to maintain his relationship with me. Listen, are y'all hearing me? Is this clear? You got to be really hungry to get this one tonight, all right? 
Now, 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 slow down for a minute. So what I am suggesting tonight, please stay with me, is that in God's mind, the purpose, and listen, if you don't understand purpose and expectations, then you're going to go into a marriage relationship and not know what you're in it for, and your expectations are going to be disappointed. You're going to feel, I'm getting the raw deal. You're going to say, I didn't know this about this person. You're going to say, they changed on me. Watch this now. The marriage relationship in God's mind was founded on this reason. Adam is by himself. But Adam, did never, Adam never said out of his mouth, I feel lonely. That's a lie. I can't stand when preachers preach that. And they talk about Adam was walking around. He looked at the, he looked at the lion and he looked at the, the, the lion had the lioness and he looked at the tiger and the tiger had the tigress and the jackass had the jackass. And, he's, and, and, and then Adam said to himself, I'm lonely. The Bible does not say that Adam said to himself, I'm lonely. Adam was so hooked up. Adam was so complete in himself. Adam was so possessed of God and so much like God that God had to tell him he needed somebody. Oh, man, y'all not hearing me now. Did you see that? And so that, so, so look, so Adam is enjoying his relationship with God so much that God has to tell him you need somebody. Adam is not desperately looking for somebody. Adam is not all over the social networking scene trying to find somebody to complete himself. Your boy Adam is already complete. He's got a place to live. He's got God's presence. He knows who he is. He's got purpose. And so now God says, look, this, month, this dude is enjoying me so much that he don't even know he needs somebody. Oh, I love the word, y'all. Uh, so God says, uh, by the way, Adam, it's not good that you by yourself. So then comes Eve, right? Now, the Hebrew word for helper means surrounding. Write that down or circle it in your Bible. The Bible says in verse 18, the Lord said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, we're going to make a move in a second. The word helper means surrounding, Okay. Now, let me ask you a question. This is Bible study, right? What does Adam need a surrounding? Matter of fact, the Hebrew word for surrounding is a military term. It means literally a defense. You know, in the Psalms, David talks about how the Lord is my defense, right? And my helper. These are terminologies of warfare that the Lord is a defender. The word, y'all know that, right? The Bible talks about how God is a defender against the hands of the enemy. The, the word of God talks about how the enemy will come in like a flood, but the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard. That's the same word. That's the same word. So, so watch this. Oh, listen, come on. <laughs> you just got to see this thing right now. This is just biblical. Can we just stay biblical for a second? So watch this now. God is saying, I, Adam is in the middle of a war zone. He don't even know it. So I got to tell him he's in a war zone. Now he tells Adam he's in a war zone. Now that he brings Eve on the scene, he brings Eve on as a warrior. Eve's, ve Eve's very role, the scripture says, she is a helper. and She is a defender. She is to surround him. She is to buttress him from the attack of the enemy. Come on now. Marriage, the root of marriage is spiritual warfare. We don't get married for happiness. We get married for holiness. Oh, come on, y'all. Are you seeing this thing now? It's not because she was fine and, and we were compatible and, and I liked her and, and, and she liked me and, and we thought we'd make good-looking kids together and, and we, we, we did business. Well, no, 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 the sex was great. Sorry, check this out. God says, look, when you are linking up, your expectation for marriage, number one, is warfare. So when you're looking for a spouse, when you link up, your spouse should be somebody that has the mindset of warfare. In other words, I'm in your life to help surround and defend you from the attack of the enemy because the only thing that matters in marriage is our relationship with God. Let me ask you a question. How easy is it to have a relationship with God? 
Talk back to me. Is it easy? No, it's not. And guess what? Guess what? And one of the people in the relationship is perfect. So if it's tough to be in relationship with a perfect person who expresses perfect love like God, then why are our expectations for each other so supernatural? Neither one of y'all perfect. <laughs> Next thing I want to say is this. The problem in marriage is never the other person. I don't care if they cheated, lied, steal. I don't care what they did for, to you. The problem in marriage, if you understand marriage from a biblical perspective, is never the other person. You want to know what the problem in marriage is? What you don't think is you, right? Right? No. The problem in marriage is marriage. Marriage is the problem. Okay, what am I saying? Marriage creates problems. Marriage was designed by God, I said it last night, to bring the best out of you and the worst out of you. Why? Because the purpose of marriage is to get us saved. The purpose of marriage is to maintain our salvation with God. The only reason why God put me and my wife Sinead together is because he wanted to use us to help both of us get into the kingdom. That's why there are no grounds for divorce. Not for converted people. Remember now, Moses said, he said, because of the heart. I know what you're saying to me. You're saying, well, adultery is grounds, right? Well, remember what Moses said. He says, because of the hardness. A hard-hearted person is not converted. So he's saying, look, if there was an unconverted person in the relationship and they haven't gotten this thing of called grace, they don't understand how relationship with God works with unconditional love. He says, then let them walk. Paul agrees with that in 1 Corinthians 6 and 7. You read it on your own. So understand now, why are there no really grounds for divorce in a, when you have two converted people? Because the relationship is supposed to help both of y'all get to the kingdom, and that never expires. Listen, now, uh, please stay with me. Can we go just a little bit deeper? Ephesians 5, which we're going to read momentarily, tells us that now, since sin has come into the world, the purpose of marriage is, is really, it is really a reenactment of the gospel. All right, so the only thing, way I can explain this is that marriage is a play. It's a movie. You and your spouse are actors in it. And what you are doing is simply demonstrating to the world, it's the most powerful witness, by the way. Ellen White says that our sermons, she says, are far less powerful in teaching people about who God is than a well-ordered and well-disciplined family. So watch this now. What the world sees is they see two imperfect people. They see how they relate to each other with unconditional love. They see the forgiveness that dwells in them. They see the hardship. They see the pain. And what we're doing is we're in reenacting. We're living the story of what God has done for us. Now, here it is. Here it is. I'm finally getting to where I want to be. The myth of marriage is that marriage should make me happy. Here's what the truth of marriage is. The truth of marriage is that God is using two people to tell a story about what God is doing in our lives. Oh, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> here it is. Here comes a bombshell right here. The reason why marriages are in trouble, why your marriage has issues, is because you do not you have not grasped somebody in that relationship does not understand the gospel. Let me just go ahead and say it. Any issue, marriage, parenting, whatever, there's always one issue. 
It's an issue of conversion. Let me tell you right now. Here's, here's what psychologists are going to tell you. They're going to tell you this is what's wrong with modern marriages. They'll tell you, number one, communication breakdown, right? We can't talk, right? Then number two, they'll say infidelity, right? This is all based on stats. Then number three, they'll say financial problems, right? These are things that cause people to divorce. Then they'll say, number four, emotional abuse. Number five, physical abuse. All these are a lie. What that says is, I am now shifting the blame to a natural reason as to why a spiritual institution called marriage is not working. Cars operate by gas. If I said my car is not running right because it doesn't have enough water in the tank, then I've misunderstood how a car runs. If I say that our marriage is messed up because we can't communicate, then I've misunderstood how a marriage works. Any marriage that is in trouble is not in trouble because of those things. It's in trouble because of spiritual reasons. And that is not an out. That's not an escape. That's not just a preacher just trying to throw something simple on it and saying, oh, they just need Jesus. I'm telling you, if people understood the gospel, if you understood what the gospel was, then your relationship in your marriage would be different. Can I tell you what the gospel is? The gospel is, hallelujah, that Bible says, while I was yet a sinner. See, we, no, 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 no. Some of the Adventists don't know, we don't understand this. We believe that the way that I'm saved is by repenting and obeying. But God saved me before I had sense to say I want to be saved. Read your Bible. The Bible says, while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for the ungodly. Ephesians tells me that before I knew to repent, he seated me in heavenly places. The whole, po the whole point of the gospel is, is that God saved me before I knew I was saved. Now all I got to do is simply accept that he's already done what he said he did. We don't operate in our relationships, especially in our marriages, on a grace system. We operate on a merit system. Here's what we say. I'll be who I ought to be if they be who they ought to be. The gospel says, ha, ah, I get excited about the gospel. The gospel says, for by grace, you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, lest any man should boast. You go a few verses before that, he says, you were dead in your sins, dead in your transgressions. The purpose of the gospel is to show us that we were so dead deep in our mess that we had no way to get ourselves out and God did not hold back his love on us because we could not live up to what he required so what God did is God sent love he sent love he sent grace he sent mercy he sent compassion even before I became righteous he gave me salvation before I knew how to ask can I tell you something else about the gospel and I asked this in my church. I says, I says how, does one, how does one get saved? They say, you repent. That's not the first step. Because guess what? You can't even take credit for repentance because the word of God says that it is the kindness of God. It is the mercy of God that even causes you to repent. In other words, the atmosphere, ha, ha, feel this, God, of our marriages should be an atmosphere where the gospel is preached in the bedroom and preached in the kitchen and preached on the sidewalk and preached in the car because we know we've been forgiven. We know we've been delivered. We know that he has mercy on us every day. We know that it is by his stripes that we've been healed. We have no business expecting more out of others than we expect out of ourselves. And we say, I <laughs> thank you, Jesus. And this is what God says. God says, I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to, I'm not going to dismiss you. It doesn't matter how ugly you act. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter how many times you crucify me. I will stand with you no matter what. I will believe God for you no matter what. 
I will hold on to you no matter what. I will literally send my son to die no matter what. Listen, here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is. The issues in our marriages, and I'm not saying those other things are not important, are rooted in unconversion. You're not saved. You do not possess the Holy Ghost. That's a hard word, isn't it? That's tough. You say, oh, come on. I'm not, come on, dog. I've been coming to church for years now. How are you going to say that? Look, I'm telling you right now. If a marriage is broke, I can tell you where to go troubleshoot. It's spiritual. Because a marriage is spiritual. Every time. Every time it's a God thing. Let me keep stepping here. If marriage, and I'm going to tell you how it works in a second, if marriage is spiritual, right, and it is a reenactment of the gospel, in other words, y'all remember the story, I believe it's in Matthew, the 18th chapter, um, let, matter of fact, let's go there, let me, let me, let me, let me just go, I'm obey the Holy Ghost, I don't know why the Lord is leading me here, but I'm just going to obey him tonight, Matthew chapter 18, right, I want you to, I want you to see something here. This is how we are to behave in marriage, especially when we're dealing with difficult people. All right? I want you to go to verse 22. I've got to move quickly. How much time do I have, Pastor? What time is it? Okay. Okay. We have about 20 minutes. Okay. Here it is. Look here. The Bible says in verse 22, it says, Jesus, well, look, go to 21. The Bible says, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother? When he sins against me, up to seven times, verse 22, Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven, right? Then verse 23, he says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Verse 24, as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. 10,000 talents. How many did I say, everybody? In modern vernacular, that's worth $211 million dollars. Okay, so, so get that in your mind. As he began to sell accounts, mm -hmm, a man who owed him 10000 or $211 million was brought to him. Verse 25, since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Verse 26 says, the servant fell on his knees before him and he said, be patient with me. Anybody ever had to pray that? He begged, and I will pay back everything. Verse 27 says, the servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. All right, so watch this now. Now watch, your boy's like, I'll pay you back. There's no way he could have paid back $211 million. He couldn't do it anyway, right? So he is, he is already in works mindset. He's already in merit mindset. He has not even appreciated what the son has done for him. The son just canceled a debt of $211 million. The point is, there's no way in the world he could have ever repaid the debt that he got in. And so he's making promises of what, what he's going to do. But the, but, the, but the master said, listen, I cancel the debt. Has the Lord not canceled the debt? I got to preach this before I go to the next point. Understand this. The debt that you owe God, there is no sinner out there that is more in debt to God than you are. Every person that has ever sinned is in debt to God beyond belief. It costs the blood of the son of the living God to save your soul. There is nothing that you could have done to merit the love of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died for your sins because you could not. Watch this. Verse 26, I got to keep moving. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants, or he found his wife, or you found your husband. You just got your debt canceled. Then his wife comes along and says, I'm not going to have sex with you.
Then the husband comes along and he's not spending quality time. He cheats. Whatever's going on in the marriage, you just got your life saved. And then they present this challenge to you, and this is what he does. He said, but when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants or his husband or his wife who owed him 100 denarii, which is like $6,000. Watch this now. He grabbed him and began to choke him and said, pay back what you owe me. He demanded. Verse 29 says, his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him. Does this not sound familiar? It sounds just like what he just did with the manager, right? Same thing. Oh, watch this, God. Hallelujah. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me. I'll, I'll pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown in prison until he could pay the debt. Now, let me ask you a question. If I'm in prison, how am I going to pay it back? And this is what is going on in our marriages. Things happen, we do things to one another, right? Thing, hurtful things have happened, and I'm not diminishing them. But what happens is the pain becomes so great for us, and many of us become addicted to the pain, that we then put the spouse in a prison that they can never get out of. Now you're doing this in the face of of a manager or a savior that just forgave you of a debt that you could never repay. Y'all see what I'm saying here? Look, 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 I'm just trying to, let 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 me cut to the chase. Whatever's going on in your marriage is spiritual. So the only way to respond to it The only way to tweak this thing and get this thing right is you gotta get you gotta stay spiritual with it. But many of us get carnal. Now watch this. Here's the most confusing scripture on marriage in the whole Bible, Ephesians 5. And I'm in here. See, Pastor, it's just impossible in one sermon to deal with all so I just figured tonight as the Lord led me I said let's just deal with the spiritual stuff let's just deal, let's, 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 let's get to the root issue here Ephesians 5 now to give you some context everybody knows this is the chapter of the Bible that talks about marriage and uh huh and so I'm going to help you in a minute verse 1 says be imitators of God there, therefore as dearly beloved children and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. So again, look at the context. Before he even starts talking about marriage, he said, get it in your mind. The way that you're supposed to conduct yourself in relationships is to model Jesus. Now, let me help you on this right now. You don't know how to do a good marriage by looking at other couples. That's what I used to think. And I'm not against marriage mentors. I think that's a good thing. But if you want to really understand how to conduct yourself in marriage, then you're supposed to look at Jesus. Because remember, marriage is a play that is reenacting what Jesus has already done for us. And how many know that Jesus loves us perfectly? He does his part in the relationship. He knows what he's doing. He's always faithful. Come on, y'all. He's always merciful. He's always loving. We can always count on him. It don't matter how ugly we act. God is always there. Come on, talk to me now. Doesn't matter what kind of day you're having. Doesn't matter how you treat him. The Lord is still kind. The Lord is still loving. The Lord stands with us us when we don't stand with him and even before we had the mind to know who he was he was already there wooing us unto himself so first thing he says pastor is he said uh so before we even talk about marriage we got to talk about Jesus now let's go on to the to the critical part verse 21 says submit to one another out of reverence for Christ Now, brothers get real excited when we go to the next verse because the next verse says in verse 22, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as to the Lord. 
And so we got brothers running around here feeling like they're superior to the sisters and demanding obedience from their wives when they didn't read the first part. The first part says, imitate Jesus. And then it says, submit to one another. And then it gave the instruction to the wife, now you can submit to him. You know why? Because he liked Jesus. Now, I'm not telling wives what to do. You let God tell you what to do. But I'm just telling you cause and effect. A woman will not submit to a man that is not submitted to Jesus. Listen, brothers, look, I, and, and brothers get mad at me every time I preach this. If you are having issues with respect from your wife and submission from your wife, it is because innately, she may not even discern it, innately she recognizes there is, that there is something missing in you that is akin to Jesus. A woman will submit to Jesus every time if she's converted. Now watch this. Watch this. <laughs> now, 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 see, once you, once you know about Jesus, you ain't scared of this text right here. Now it says, verse 22 says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. The word submit means to obey. Let's not, let's not, somebody told me at a wedding one time. I'm marrying somebody. At a wedding, they said, don't use the word submit. We got another version of the Bible for you. Don't, don't use that word submit. We don't believe in that. That's, that's, not a good, that's not a good version, translation. Okay, so I'll give you the original. The original means to obey. Now look, unconverted spouses resist that word. If you're carnal, you will not submit unto a man as unto the Lord. Now, now look, that makes it even worse. It says, submit unto your husband as if he is the Lord. Amen. Amen. Peace, Pastor. Peace. Listen, do you see why marriages are in trouble? Because the rules for marriage that God set up can only be followed by converted people. As unto the Lord? <laughs> Listen, man, when the Lord speaks, we're supposed to obey. Yeah. When the Lord says jump, you're supposed to say how high. Yeah. When the Lord says shut up, you're supposed to say shut up. Yeah. Oh, y'all can't pray for me in here. <laughs> but see, many of us, we resist that word because all we, we've, not, we've not looked at this from a spiritual mind. But if he acts like the Lord, you ain't going to have no problem in submitting. All right, let's keep stepping here. Verse 30, 23 says, for the husband, the, I mean, the Bible does not make it easy for us at all. Look, it says, for the husband is the head of the wife. <laughs> Look, man, I've tried to get around this thing for a long time. It's in the word. <laughs> Amen, somebody. Oh, I got some concerned looks on the faces in here. <laughs> but look, let me tell you something. When you're in Jesus... This stuff don't even bother you because you understand what it means. Don't worry, I'm going to help you out in a second, but I got I to gotta put the force of it in right now. Obey, sisters. Submit unto him like the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Verse... For well, the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the what, everybody? Verse 24, I'm almost done. Now, as the church submits to Christ, talking about the woman, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. All right, so look. Hear me out on this, brothers. The number one thing, my wife gave me a book and I was reading it. Oh, it felt so in line with the word tonight. The number one thing that a woman wants from her man is for, to, for, her, for him to love her as Christ loves the church. She wants a, God, a converted woman now. Not no carnal sister. A converted woman wants a godly man to love her that way 
And when she senses that she is being loved unconditionally, she will withhold nothing. Let me testify for a minute because I see y'all need some help. Let's be real. So your boy already got into marriage with sexual issues. You know, just struggling with all kind of lust. Come on, talk to me, brothers in here. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> it's just in the, it's in the air. Amen. It's just in the air. I'm not, I'm not unique. <laughs> your amens are telling me I'm unique. But I know that I'm not unique in here tonight. If you are a brother living in 2013 and you are heterosexual, you have already been predisposed to issues of lust. And I know I'm preaching. Preach, Myron. <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. Yes, I know. Yeah, I know I am. And so, so here comes Myron. And I'm like, oh, I can't wait to get married because we're going to be having sex every night. Every day. In the morning. Come on in here, somebody. Woo, I was like, oh, praise God. And you know what? Early on, you know what I'm saying? Because the flames were burning. Come on, y'all don't want to pray with me. Oh, boy, your boy was, your boy was good. But I had not made the shift from boyfriend to husband. And so my, I'm going to tell you right now, women's expectations change as soon as you say I do. <laughs> Won't he will. <laughs> Listen, even for those of us who were fornicating before we got married, before you got married, as soon as you get married, it ain't coming like it came before. I'm talking to the brothers just for a minute. Can I do that? And so I started realizing that she was withholding herself emotionally, withholding herself from me sexually. And then you know, what happens, brothers? We get mad. Silent treatment. Huh? Huh? And we have those moments. Uh, I, I got permission from my wife, so don't, don't, don't feel bad. Don't feel bad for me. It's all good. We, we, we in ministry together. We're trying to help folk out here. And, 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 so, and so in the middle of the night, I have, I have not loved on her. I have, not, I have not affirmed her. I have not created a context for love. I have not displayed grace. I've been mean to her. But now that I'm feeling something, I, I elbow her about 12 in the, in the middle of the night and say, are, are you awake? And she turn over, and your boy is all, he's riled up now. <laughs> all all kind of chemistry is at work. And so, you know, when you're mad, you just get up. You can't sleep now, brothers. And so you just get to clean in the house and, uh, come on. <laughs> Preach, Myron. I'm doing the best I can because I can't get no help in here. I'm just telling some examples of my story. Amen. And so after a while, after a while, resentment began to build up in me. And, and I was not seeing this thing spiritually. I was saying, somebody asked, what's the problem with your marriage? We ain't having sex. <laughs> then kids come along. <laughs> and them little Negroes begin to crawl in the bed. Yeah. Blocking. And look, and this is, this is how your boy, and now this is what I thought. I said, man, I get married, we'll have lots of sex. I won't struggle with lust no more. But marriage brings the best and the worst simultaneously. Now I'm realizing I can't just say, let's get busy. I can't just pat her on her behind and think something's going to happen. And I never forget what the Holy Ghost told me. He said, you want her body more than you want her. He said, you are using your wife to fulfill yourself. He said, you have abdicated your role and function as Savior. Therefore, she will not submit to you. Then comes porn. Listen, I know, fellas, I, I, I can't preach the lady's side because I'm not one. I can only preach my side, amen? Yeah, bring a sister in here and let her give the other side. I can only give what I can give. 
But do you see what is happening here now? And self is all in the way. It's all about what I'm not getting. And it's all about what, 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 what I'm not doing for her. And what I did not realize is, is marriage is not about what I am getting, but marriage is totally about what I'm giving. By the way, let me just throw this out here parenthetically. You can tell by the way you have sex and by the way that you go about getting sex. It is a revelation of the depths of your soul and the soul of your marriage. So there is no submission going on. You know why? Because I ain't the Lord. I don't even look like him. I got my hands out all the time. And when she's not being who I want her to be, then I stop being who I'm supposed to be. How many know? That's why you got to have the Holy Ghost to be married. If Listen, single folk, if you ain't filled with the Holy Ghost and they're not filled with the Holy Ghost, don't even waste your time. This thing ain't for suckers. This thing ain't no joke. They glamorize this thing. You watching TV and they got, and we spending all these all this money on these weddings. Oh God. Made no investment in the marriage. So watch now. Because I abdicated my role. And what is the role? Headship, right? That's headship, right? But the Bible says, as Christ loved the church. Now, let me ask you this. How does Christ love, how does he operate in headship? Christ's headship, brothers, is not you do this, you do that, shut up, woman, cook my food, let's have sex, watch the game with me, let me hang out with my friend. That's not what Christ does. What Christ does, and you please get this now, he biblical headship, another word for it is servant leadership. Christ is first in sacrifice. Let me tell you what it means to be a husband. The, what it means to be a husband is to be first. That's it. Not first in getting your plate, first in making it. First in sacrifice. First in self-denial. We're first because we're, we, are, we are mimicking the life of Christ to the church. So everything we do is mimicking Jesus. Look at Philippians 2. Look at Philippians 2. I, I'm, I promise I'm going to read one more text and I'll be done. Philippians 2, all right? Okay, it's 817. All right, it's time to almost wrap up. Philippians 2, watch this. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you, brothers, right now, what it means to lead in the headship of Christ. I'll talk about the ladies, and I'll sit down. Philippians 2 says, in verse, uh, let's go to verse 3. No, go to verse 2. It says, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, <laughs> consider your spouse better than yourself. Verse 4, each of you should look not only to your interests, but also to the interests of others. Verse 5, your attitude, here's headship right here. Your attitude, or let this mind, your mindset should be the same as that of Christ. And then the Bible goes on to say what he did. He just gave up. He gave up. He gave up. He gave up. He gave. He denied. He gave. He gave. And then he gave his life. So here's biblical headship for the brothers. Sacrifice. Dying. Being first to give up your way. Being first to say you're sorry. If you don't want that, then you didn't know what you was getting into. Go back to Ephesians. I promise I'm going to end here. The 
Bible says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Verse 28, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Verse 29, after all, no one ever hated his body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. I'm coming to you, sisters. For we are members of his body. Verse 31, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become what? One flesh. Verse 32, this is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ in the church. Verse 33, finally, however... Each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself. And here it goes, sisters. And the wife must respect her husband. Now, the Bible says that the husband is supposed to love you as the church. The Greek there tells us that he is supposed to get as close to Jesus as he possibly can. But remember, you didn't marry Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, y'all ain't talking to me now, sisters. <laughs> so I, the people always ask me, so if my husband is not submitted to the Lord the way I feel that he should be, does that mean that I should not submit to him? But remember now, the Bible didn't give you any qualifications for submission. Don't worry about the brother. You submit because, catch this now, what God has called both of you guys to do, according to Ephesians 5 and Philippians 2, is both of you to act like Jesus. Christ, the man, acts like Jesus in saving the woman. The woman acts like Jesus because she represents the body of Christ. In other words, this is what the Bible says. Both of y'all act like Jesus. Amen. Amen. So even if he ain't acting like he's supposed to act, take care of him. Even if he ain't loving on you the way he should, keep loving on him. The only way to change a person is to let God do it through you as you are loving them, not trying to change them. The only thing that changes lives is love. If you keep putting the love of Jesus on his sorry soul, then at some point maybe Jesus will awaken in him the king that dwells in him. And he will raise up and become. But remember what you got into. I'm done. Pastor, he ain't this. He not that. She ain't this. Oh, yeah, no, no, I didn't spend a lot of time with the ladies. Well, you know why? Because I think about 80% of the problems in marriages belongs to the spirituality of men. But since we got so many sisters in here tonight whose husbands didn't come along with them, you're saying to me, what am I going to do about him? He trifling. He got no drive in him. What my response is to you is, what did Jesus do for you? Stand in the gap. Sorry, that's the only news I got for you. And guess what? Every story does not end with a happy ending. You know why? Because this thing is ugly. This thing is messy. You know why? Because it's about saving souls. At the end of the day, what's the success of my marriage? The success of your marriage is that both of y'all got into the kingdom. And you don't stop putting Jesus on him. You don't stop putting Jesus on her until they reflect who Jesus is. I never shall forget. I remember the first time I had to come tell my wife. I was tired of secret sin. So I'll never forget that I went to my wife and I said, and here I am preaching. And Doc, I'm getting calls to go everywhere. Everywhere. This goes to show you can minister that word. <laughs> I'm telling you, where the rubber meets the road, you can tell if you saved or not at home. <laughs> Holy Ghost said, tell your wife. I never forget the conversation. I said, baby, look, I got to be first. 
I got to be first. I said, I, I, I got a problem with pornography. And I realized that I'm doing it when I'm angry. And I'm resentful to you because I don't feel like you're doing what I think you should do. But I need to pause and own the fact that I have not been Jesus to you. At that point, I made myself vulnerable to my wife leaving me. And I can't even get into you the history. She did not want to go through that. But we live in Christ. Even in that moment, I had to humble myself and say, look, I can sit here and pick all the stuff that's wrong with you, but if I'm honest and if I'm checking my motives carefully, there's some junk in me, and I need to know, will you forgive me? I, look, and this is why I told the, young, the, 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 the singles yesterday. See, stuff like this going to happen in your marriage. I'm not prophesying negativity. What I am telling you is marriage is real. And it brings out the worst in you. When it comes out, you have got to own it. All I remember, man, crying on my face, expecting for her to say, I'm done. It's her, I just, her tears and sobbing, and she wrapped her arms around me, and she prayed a prayer over my life. I don't remember what she prayed. I don't remember what she said. I just know that I felt Jesus. I ain't there yet. But we are both starting to learn that the success of our relationship is based on how much each of us reflects Jesus. I can't study your relationship no more. I'm studying. I'm looking at Christ. Some of you didn't come from good marriages, so you don't know what a good marriage looks like. Some of you don't have your parents. I mean, you, I mean how many dysfunctional relationships? So how are you going to know what to do? Look at Jesus. All this holding out and fighting and resentment and tension in the house and all that kind of stuff. Tomorrow, I'm going to tell you the vehicle that God is going to use to bring about the kind of restoration we need. Father in heaven right now. Somebody needs to say they're wrong. Somebody needs to admit, I too have been a part of the problem. Because we are zeroed in the fact that this success of this relationship is our sole salvation, we're no longer trying to be defensive. We're no longer standing in our corner saying, I ain't doing nothing until they come and apologize. Because, Father, you didn't wait on us to repent before you saved our souls. Grace! Break our hearts with your grace, God. Take away the bitterness and the anger and the hurt and help us to look back to Calvary and see what you did for us. There is nothing that has ever been done to us that is worse than what we did to you. God, break us from our resentment and our pride. I don't know who you are tonight, but God is calling somebody tonight who is in a relationship a marriage relationship. And all I wanted you to see tonight is that it's a spiritual issue. And you can't fight spiritual issues with carnal stuff. If you're here right now and the light bulb finally went off in your head, I want you to just stand to your feet and come down and let us pray for you tonight. Couple, bring your wife, bring your husband.
The other thing about this thing is, man, the minute you think you got, got over one thing, <laughs> it just never stops. <laughs> How many know it never stops? You always are seeing areas where you can grow, where you can be more loving. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. If you get close to Jesus, if you start looking more at him, if you start understanding what righteousness by faith is, what the gospel has done in your life, your attitude going to change. You won't be putting people in prisons because of stuff they did because you know God could have left you in a prison. I'm sorry, I have nothing else for you pertaining to what is going on with the specifics of your relationship. Let's talk big picture here. Big picture is, God put the two of you together. I'm not trying to hear that you never should have got married. You're married now. I ain't trying to hear that. Now, once you made the covenant to get married, then God has invested himself in the success of it. Even if you shouldn't have done it, you're married now. There's no out here. But there is a God who says he will walk with you through this thing. But you cannot do it in the flesh. No blame game, no holding on to stuff. And, 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 so, and so, Pastor, how do I let that thing go? I want you to look back at Jesus. I want you to look at the cross. And I want you to see every single sin that he has forgiven you of. I want you to refresh your memory of the grace that he poured out in your life. I want you to reacquaint yourself with how he answers prayers and how he keeps talking to you, how he is interceding for you, how he has never left you, how his grace and his mercy has kept you. I want you to reacquaint, look to Jesus. Don't look at him. Don't look at her. There is no dispute. There is no affair. There's no situation that is so bad and so hurtful that it surpasses what you've done to Jesus. And here's the thing. It's a miracle. It is not natural. As you keep running to Jesus, as you keep grabbing a hold to the cross, something inside you changes. I cannot explain it. But the hatred and the bitterness and the pain, God takes it. I don't know how he does it, but, he, but through his love and his kindness, he takes our stuff. Be anxious for nothing. But by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, count your blessings. Count your blessings. He said, in the peace of God, I don't know how it happens, will guard your heart and your mind. A peace that passes understanding. You'll be in the same house with that fool and you will learn how to love on them. Because God is not just trying to save them. He's trying to save you. Father, we stretch our hands to heaven right now. And Father, we confess right now that we cannot do marriage in our flesh. This thing is beyond us. First of all, you're asking us men to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Who in here can do that? Except your spirit. Except we are baptized with your spirit, God. And Father, we've got to confess tonight that there are some of us, we are only spiritual when, when it's time to go public. God, we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost right now. We won't be able to love our wives. Father, then for sisters, 
The word of God calls you to respect your husbands. It's not natural for you. It's not natural for him to love you. That's natural for you to do. It's natural for him to respect you, but it's unnatural for you to love, for, for you to respect him. God has called both of us to do stuff that's not natural for us because, my sister, he wants to do it through you. You can't do it. You can't love him. Holy Ghost. I don't know, there may be somebody else. You're not married, but you need to come up here because you need the Holy Ghost. You've been trying to deal with spiritual things in a carnal way, and you've been losing. I'm telling you right now, if you get born again, if you get filled with God, then you will be able to deal with the powers of darkness. This is not for games. The enemy is trying to steal souls and destroy families and destroy children. Run to Jesus. Come out of your seat. Lift up off your feet and run to the master. I know they did this and I know they did that. But I'm telling you right now, it's all a smoke screen from the devil. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power. Run to Jesus. Somebody may need to stand in the gap for somebody else's marriage. Come out of your seat and run to the master and say, God, help me. you got to live in me. I cannot do this thing. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. Marriage does not come naturally. The way to do marriage is you got to have God in your life. You will grow to hate your spouse. Now, right now, somebody needs to release a spouse from a prison that you've put them in. And you feel they deserve to be treated the way they're being treated. And what the word says is you treat them the way I treated you. I gave you a pass. I gave you a pass. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, God. While I was yet a sinner, you died for me. Grace and mercy. Right where you stand. Right where you stand right now. You confess it with your mouth and you say, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I cannot forgive. Say it again. I cannot forgive on my own I don't want to the pain is too great spirit of the living God you forgive through me help me to release them from the prison that I have bound them in I'm saying release them the way God has released you. Scripture says that if we do not forgive, then he will not forgive us. God will, God will bring back every sin that you've ever committed and he will hold it against you. Release. Release your father. Release your mother. Release that wayward, philandering, cheating husband. Release him. Release that bitter, angry, mean, selfish wife. Release her. Release his mean self. Release. Release her with her mouth. Release them. They are a work in progress, and so are you. Release them. Father, I bind the, I bind the, I bind the spirit right now, God, as your spirit is moving. I bind the spirit of pride right now.
Father, your spirit is moving to somebody right now that on tonight, that on tonight they are to make something right with a family member, with a spouse, that on tonight they are not to lay their head down to the pillow until they, until they release. Father, in the name of Jesus, teach us how to talk to each other. Help our words to be spirit-filled. Help us to not go into attack mode, but help us to talk to one another the way you talk to us. Neither I can, do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's the word to you. Somebody's got to call a child tonight. And remember, the scripture does not say that somebody must come to apologize to you if they've done wrong to you. The scripture says in Matthew 5 that when somebody has done you wrong, when you know that somebody has an issue with you, you go to them. Write a letter. Send them a text. But release somebody tonight. Drop the charges. Dismiss the court document. I feel the enemy warring right now. Father, we press through right now because our feelings have been hurt. We have, some of us have been humiliated, disrespected, embarrassed, used, God. But we know that we cannot be saved when our hearts are filled with dead things. God, in the name of Jesus, heal us. If our spouse don't want to go to heaven, we're going to go anyhow, God. We're going to have to have power. God, I, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Father, we're going to have to have supernatural power to deal with that person. We're, we're going, if you need it tonight, lift your hands. We're, if you need supernatural power, God, I know what I'm, we're going to need power to do this thing. It cannot come from the inside. It must come from the outside. You must send power in us, oh God, to save some of these marriages. Some of the folk have given up altogether. God, send power, God. God, I pray for that husband right now that is holding his ground, that is mad as hell, God, and he doesn't want to let it go. I pray in the name of Jesus that the sun will arise with healing in his wings and break him, God. Let the love of Jesus flow, God. Flow, Holy Ghost. I pray for that sister, God. Her mind is made up, God. She's been embarrassed and humiliated one too many times. Neglected, abandoned, abused. Set her free, Jesus. Your word says, whom the Son shall set free is hallelujah, is free indeed. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set us free. We come against the devil tonight in the name of Jesus, and we stand on the word of God for the saving of marriages. In Jesus' name, work a miracle, God.
God, for those of us who are not married but that are looking on at marriages that are falling apart and we're gossiping about it, God, help us to start praying in the spirit. Help us to stand in the gap for them, oh God. No matter what they've done, God, help us to shut our mouths and learn how to wait on God and cry out to God and intercede, Lord. Help us not to look for the faults of others, oh God. But let this place, let Bladensburg be an atmosphere of grace. Oh, let the grace of God flow in this place, God. God, 70 times 7, God. Let there be grace in here. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody want to say thank you just for being here tonight. I think the Spirit of God is telling us tonight He is more concerned with making us holy than He is happy. Father, we just thank you for this moment tonight. Truth be told, we don't want to leave this moment. Because when we leave this moment, we got to live what we just heard. And if we can just stay in this moment, if we can stay on the mountain, then we have the privilege to just not having to live what we heard. But when we say amen, we got to go to the valley and fight. So give us warfare clothes. Give us a warring spirit. Give us a warring mindset to be able to fight. Because it's rough out here trying to be holy. Father, we need you. Just help, help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, put your hands together for Jesus. Come on, put your hands together for Jesus. He was here tonight. Let's just go back to our seats with a praise in our mouth. You, you don't have to stop praising because we're we going back to our seats. You ought to say thank you to Jesus. You didn't know, and I didn't know what, uh, what kind of journey this was going to be on when we started this year dealing with families. And, my God. Yo, it's rough when you, you got to live stuff you preach. Dude, I was, I was uh, and I don't think I told you, I was in here one uh, Believer's Night, Wednesday night, Pastor John's preaching on forgiveness. And I had issues with people because when I was sick, people I thought was going to be there wasn't there and I'm walking around Carl County Drug I'm upset and I'm here teaching on forgiveness and I got folk I ain't forgiven and I'm teaching with power amen pastor and I got to my car and stopped weeping the Lord said you a lie I said no God if somebody hurt me and how many like me when somebody hurts you you like having an upper hand come on y'all y'all devil is a liar the spirit of God fell here tonight obedience should be in the house I want to not forgive you because if I don't forgive you, then I got an upper hand in the relationship. God says, start texting people. I'm in my car sitting right out front. Alarm is set. And I'm in my car just weeping because when you forgive somebody, you got real power to live. And I believe, was God here tonight? Okay. Come on, stand to your feet as we close.